You're listening to Pixelated Audio, Expansion Pack 21. And welcome back to Pixelated Audio, your bi-weekly video game music and retro gaming podcast. We are your hosts. I'm Brian, and this is James. Hello, everyone. And today we're doing another expansion pack. It's the holiday season, so we're kind of on a time crunch, as yeah. always, during this this part of the year. Yeah, even the, the very first year that we did this show, which I think we we're only about six months in, we found that November was very hard to put together any type of episodes. It's way harder than, like, December, which yeah. is Christmas. That's actually a lot easier for whatever yeah. reason. But. Well, I think for Christmas, it's kind of like everything's kind of prepared and ready to go. Whereas Thanksgiving, there's That's, so much to do and right. so much family and stuff like that. So Yeah. So uh, today we just picked out some random tunes. Some are kind of, you know, catered, chosen mm-hmm. tracks, but uh, I think we got a great selection. I don't know your picks. I kind of oversaw one of them <laughs> yeah. and I think we have some crossover. Yeah. I think for the first time, uh, just w- with an episode of just you and me, and there was no theme at all. Uh, I think this is the first time we're ever going to have some overlap. But uh, Yeah, but you know what? I think uh, we got a lot of great tracks today. Uh, like that first one mm-hmm. that we came in with. That was Victory is Imminent from Lord Monarch. And I love this soundtrack so much. It's the FM Towns version, actually. Released in 1991 by Nihon Falcom. And uh, this was composed by the Falcom sound team, JDK. Uh, a little more specifically, the three people that worked on this album were Mieko Ishikawa, Atsushi Shirakawa, and Masaaki Kawai. And uh, this track, I think, is... Uh, I, I mean, I listened to this like on the way to work. I love this mm-hmm. song so much. What do you think? Yeah, I thought it was uh, very cool. It had a, a cool kind of mellow, like organy type start. And then it really kind of abruptly changes to something completely different, Yeah, and uh, which I thought was cool. And at first it was kind of... Uh, a little harsh but then i was like you know what i really like this this is really neat it has really bouncy drums uh, it felt very fun and that uh, drum breakdown towards the end or where the loop is uh, was really kind of cool so I-, I liked it it was a very kind of uh smiley bright track on this gloomy cloudy day that we're <laughs> recording <laughs> yeah uh it feels kind of good recording and it's like kind of pouring rain outside yeah it's kind of nice uh when i was a kid playing video games like that was I, I spent a lot of time outside mm-hmm. and so on days that i spent you know pretty much all day playing games and stuff it was on rainy days so mm-hmm. it kind of gives me that feeling but i uh, i like it. so that beginning part that da, 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 that's actually um kind of a theme throughout mm-hmm. i think it's the kind of the start to each of the um kind of missions that that you do in this game but then that 
after after that that's when the track kind of picks up and it kind of goes into its own thing and it's got you know its own chorus and all that stuff i really like the uh the stop in there it's like um uh da 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 Da, 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 mm. You know what I mean, and it continues. I kind of like that. Like it, it's got that kind of like the kick instead of the pla- in place of the note. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that I don't know. I, I just I thought this track is super fun. The the horn section sounds really, really trumpety, really regal, mm-hmm. like a castle, and uh, almost like you know you're walking into the knight's court or king's court or whatever. And yeah, it's kind of I don't know. I just thought it's a fun track. No, it, it felt very fitting of, of the time. It felt uh, like retro, but it felt like it was in a style that was older than the year that it came out. But uh, I, I really liked it. I thought it was, like I said, very fun and kind of uh, perky. Have we, uh, we played a few FM Towns tracks. Yeah, I think uh, we've played a couple. Yeah, and yeah. There's some other things peppered in, I think, over the years. But. I think just like when we, we talk about a certain game, like there's like a port or something that we've played a track from. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we haven't done like a full focus on it yet and we, right. we will at some point a good portion of the games that were released on the fm towns used red book audio for most of the games uh and they were usually ports of you know something else like pc 88 or pc 98 for example that had you know if it was like an fm game or something that would be ported directly over uh and the sound converted directly over mm-hmm. as well the exact same music data basically uh, that's because the FM Towns actually uses the YM2612. And now we know that the Genesis or the Mega Drive used the 2612 as well. Right. But it's clocked slightly slower at about 7.6 megahertz. Uh, but for the FM Towns, it uses the same clock speed, or it's really, really close to the YM2608, which is like uh, just under 8 megahertz. The accompanying chip that goes with the FM Towns is the Rico RF5C68, which can do eight channels of 8-bit PCM, uh, which is also used in the Sega CD and the Sega System 18 and 32 arcade boards, sometimes like with a slightly different name or something. Um, but these two chip combinations are basically what we kind of saw out of every other comparable system at the time, like, you know, the... Uh, Sharp X68000 with its 2151 and the Oki chip. Uh, so it's kind of like that. But unfortunately, a lot of the games that, well, I guess not unfortunately, but a lot of the games <laughs> that came out for the FM Towns were all CD audio. So we didn't really get to hear as much FM as uh, maybe we we could have, right. I guess, unless it was ports. So eventually we'll cover an FM Towns game. Uh, we just got to find the right one that we want to we want to look into. Yeah, and there's going to be so much cool information. I think we can dig up on the the system itself, and uh, you know, like you said, the right game. Yeah. So uh, a little bit about the composer. So Mieko Ishikawa, one of my favorite composers from the Falcom Sound Team JDK, started in 1987 and stayed in the sound department until 1997. Uh, worked on the first five Ease games, a bunch of titles in the Dragon Slayer series and the Legend of Hero series, Brandish 1 and 2, and also Popful Mail. We've mm-hmm. talked about her quite a lot on that episode. Uh, there's Atsushi Shirakawa, uh, also known as Tenmon, worked at Falcom, contributing to a lot of the same games as Ishikawa. In 2002, he kind of dropped off of game music and started uh, scoring anime and movie soundtracks like She and Her Cat, Voices of a Distant Star, which is... Um, it's like this short film that I actually got the DVD for it because I really mm-hmm. liked it. Um, like I want to say like 15 years ago or something like that. But uh, now he's just doing original music and he's got a few albums that he's released. Very cool. Yeah, Masaaki Kawai worked on the PC88 version of Poffle Mail. So talked about Masaaki as well. Uh, and the Sharp X68000 version of Ease 3 and also some Dragon Slayer and Legend of Hero stuff too. Wow. Uh... Did I talk about Lord Monarch? Like all? the actual gameplay style? Yeah. No. No. Okay. Well, it's a top-down real-time strategy title. It's kind of like a spin-off of the Dragon Slayer series. Okay. And um, I guess you're a prince named Alfred. You've been kind of like this this lazy boy and you're not really um, pulling your weight around the, the castle keep. <laughs> and uh, the king decides to strengthen you up by sending you to battle. And now you're 16 years old and you must prove yourself being worthy of the prince that you are it's kind of like any other i don't think there's anything really special about it It was released on the genesis Mm -hmm. as well and i know um a lot of people like the genesis soundtrack but i prefer this one it's right different well Uh, we have a great love for the genesis but uh i mean there's some really obscure systems that can really take the cake when compared to a port on something a little bit more well known yeah and you know uh the game itself was actually a port of the pc 98 game 
graphics are really pretty, but uh, we'll talk about that another day. So let's yeah. get into our next track. Awesome. Well, I think uh, since we know for offhand that there's going to be a little bit of overlap, I might as well get my track out of the way so that you can maybe put yours in later on <laughs> so they're not back to back or something. But uh, I'm going to play a track from a game called Lagoon, and the track is called Premonition. You just heard Premonition from a game called Lagoon on the X68000, released in 1990, developed and published by Zoom, composed by Hideki Suzuki. This is uh, this is an awesome track, and uh, I this is an awesome soundtrack in <laughs> yeah, general. Yeah, this tra- soundtrack and is Because great. I picked uh, a song from this soundtrack as well. We didn't plan this. Yeah, and thankfully it wasn't the same track, so yeah. you, ha- you have a different track to play. So. Yeah, I should just play that one next. <laughs> yeah. yeah, have a little, uh, a little Lagoon and, break. And, and we'll uh, combine our notes. Makes sense. Nice. All right, so uh, I, I I thought this track was incredible. That that hit, that snare hit, mm-hmm. sounds like somebody's like bashing a car with a bat. Yeah, it's so strong. And then like later on, it switches up to somebody kicking a dumpster. Yeah, it has like just a really raw, loud, like heart stopping, you know, thud to it. I I really like it. Yeah, no, I've I've always been a big fan of those. Really, like the drums are not crazy. Like they're not just like no. like they're not all over the place. But they're they're really slow and really like prominent and i've always really liked that in a lot of tracks like the valise track that i really liked and the uh, dungeons and dragons track that i really liked it had that that similar quality with like the really hollow heavy drums kind of uh, like Tak takashi abo's stuff yeah and and but this track too like so obviously the, in the in the bulk of the song the drums are are kind of like right out there in the front and in your face but there's all those parts where the drums kind of take uh, take a break and it's really beautiful and right. still like sinister and moody all by itself and then it just comes right back in with the douche and it's yeah. like man this it was i really like this track a lot as soon as i heard it um this is actually the first track on the soundtrack i was like yep this is it, this is it. done <laughs> uh there's that one part where it's like it's really quiet and it's got this um it almost reminds me of like a like some kind of like science fiction um 
like some new HBO show and it's like the opening track and like, mm-hmm. you know, they're building almost like Westworld or oh, something. Okay, yeah, they I didn't can have see a piano that. thing. Yeah. Kind of like, a, well, I guess like Stranger Things or something like that. Yeah, it has yeah, like yeah, an yeah, 80s yeah. feel to the whole thing, but I can kind of see that. And uh, uh, one thing I really liked about this track too was the really cool stereo panning it had with the really subtle twinklies. It was like in one year and then the next year. And so it, you, it gave you the sense that like, they're going to do some repetition with it and you can kind of enjoy it. And, Oh, I didn't quite catch that, but it's going to come back around again. There so. is, there is something about the panning that I like. There's that one kind of stray rogue Tom that mm-hmm. just comes in. It's like, you hear that, uh, that really kind of eerie part. And then it's all of a sudden like in one ear, it's like, don't, yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? Like, yeah, that I noticed from? that just one ear, but, uh, no, I, I like that. I thought the, um, the use of stereo and kind of like, kind of adding these, uh, these small touches is always awesome. And just a, just a fun track. The soundtrack is, incredible let's uh let's talk about the the composer a little bit hideki suzuki yeah so hideki suzuki uh, i did see that uh, he has a few games on his list of credits as a composer which is uh ragnagar deadly moves and genocide but he actually has a lot of other stuff he's he's I listed saw that. for layers yeah. like there is he did design he did programming art and graphics video and cinemato- cinematography and this wasn't just in the past. So he worked on games in 2016. I saw a bunch of like WWE wrestling games that he yeah. did stuff for. And he actually did cinematography for Resident Evil 4. Wow. Uh, and all the different versions of it. I don't know if it's the same cinematography or what, but he was credited for the original release, the, the update, and then the HD remake. So. See, that's funny because when I was looking, I, I, I saw he did a lot of uh, instruction manuals. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and also like QA and stuff. Like the guy's like done everything. Yeah, I mean, he's been doing, it looked like he did programming all the way back on uh, like Ragnar and Deadly Moves and all that stuff. But um, as his career progressed, it looked like he got into graphics. I saw some Dragon Ball game back in like the, I think it was the 80s or 90s. He did graphics for and stuff like that. So I was like, wow, this guy has... Uh, not only is an amazing composer, but has so many other skills that are useful and that have kept him in the industry until, you know, very recent. I mean, still going today. Right, right. And uh, so to kind of uh, build upon that, since I have my notes here, I have some kind of different notes. So um, the the team that he worked on, so Zoom actually had their, their own in-house sound team. It was called the Zoom sound team or the Zoom reversible band. <laughs> okay. And yeah, and so uh, there was a few guys in there, um, uh, members in the band and uh, or in the the sound unit i guess Mm -hmm. and uh they also did programming and stuff like that but they kind of like they had their own little group within the company there was akihito okawa hideyuki shimono and naoyuki kimura they uh they did a bunch of different albums they released soundtracks and stuff together um as you know like did the arrangements and stuff when Mm -hmm. the, the actual ost was was released and published as a standalone cd and um i guess the they just kind of had fun doing like you know game compositions but they all had their uh, other roles within the company so kind of neat zoom sound team i didn't really know anything about them so it was kind of cool to to learn uh all about these guys i couldn't find any more information though so yeah well that's why i think if if we ever did a lagoon episode um we would have much more time to dive in to find some really cool stuff about the game and the company and you know cross-reference things and stuff so uh, but I guess we could save a little bit about the game for after you play your track. Yeah, why don't we uh, <laughs> listen to my track? My track is called Valley from Lagoon. Uh, again, 1990 for the Sharp X68000.
All right, that was Valley from Lagoon, released in 1990 for the Sharp X68000, developed and published by Zoom, composed by Hideki Suzuki. This was a pretty cool track. It was, you know, very different. It very had, different. It had yeah. a lot more energy, and uh, to me, it was. I thought it was very fun, but kind of like fun in like a hardcore way, and it, kind of like a hardcore dance. Yeah, it, it, it kind of reminded me, or made me think of like a like hardcore rock and roller with like the leather jacket and the studs and the chains and stuff. Yeah, we're yeah. like skipping down the street having fun, <laughs> like because it it had all that you know distortion and the aggressive feel of the song, but. To me, it still gave me this kind of like smiley, fun feeling. It, it had a real uppity mm-hmm. feel, even though, yeah, it's got this kind of grunge behind it. Like, yeah. I think the the background, the that kind of mid range, uh, has like this really kind of uh, like distorted guitar sound, but like the upper end is a little more bright, mm-hmm. and so that makes kind of this weird juxtaposition, like where you're getting this like very colorful front end but the the back is really kind of like grungy and dirty and mm-hmm. uh, i think that's why the track has that that you know rocker skipping down the street yeah field. <laughs> yeah it's very textured I like yeah it. yeah yeah so again this is using the ym2151 and the oki pcm chip and uh let's talk about the game a little bit lagoon uh looks really interesting i actually played about 30 seconds of it mm-hmm. and uh realized i didn't have time to play anymore but i something i really want to like kind of dive into a little more yeah now this was a action rpg so uh you move around and you fight things in real time which is pretty cool and the graphics actually reminded me a lot of uh brain lord which we did an episode on recently yes yes it i actually was like kind of weirded out by like how i was like is this related in some way because it, it has a similar look to the way they they decided to do the black the characters and, yeah and yeah. The, uh, the shadows and they aren't like like squatty, like chibi characters. They're like, you know, full grown people. It's not like, it, it, it's a lot like Zelda, like A Link to the Past, but uh, like as far as like gameplay goes, but the the graphics are definitely Brain Lord. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. And the style and everything looked really cool and clean. And I thought, wow, this actually does look really fun. Like Brain Lord was a really cool RPG. And I mean, since they kind of have a similar feel, I would, I would assume that, you know, well, it would kind of give me the feeling that this one would be pretty fun too. And the sprites are very big, and that gave me this feeling of like this, like a Game Boy Color version of it. Like the sprites take up a lot of screen real estate, um, so they're big and nice, but uh, everything feels kind of confined, which I think for an action RPG would be kind of neat. Yeah, you know the the story itself. Uh, did you read into it at all? I think I briefly glossed over it because I didn't want to go into too much. But the- right, I, I mean, it's 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 kind of simple. Like I guess you're on this quest to take out this evil known as Zera. And, uh, you know, he, I guess he polluted all the water making people sick. Oh. And so like your whole thing is to go out and like take care of him. But like along the way through your quest, you help all these other people. And so it's like the, the game kind of has like these weird branches and, uh, you kind of like follow different little story paths and get, you know, sidetracked, but mm-hmm. in a good way. And so it, it looks really interesting. And kinda I guess it sounds it, like ease or something. Yeah. And I guess this got ported, um, this was ported to Super Nintendo as well mm-hmm. so um I, I i was actually listening do you want to hear what the super nes version sure. of this sound song sounds like it's very different kind of sounds like a yoshi band <laughs> Doesn't, yeah. It's like very like more acute and kind of like not full, but uh, it, it's all still there. It's just I love it. The, sound. the Yoshi band. That's yeah. exactly that's exactly what I was. Imagine thinking. like all different colored Yoshis like yeah, playing the song. Played a different instrument, like one Yoshi like with like the the brass knuckles on. Yeah. It's all hardcore <laughs> earrings. Uh, yeah. So cool game. Let's move on to our next. What do you got, James? Uh, next up, I have a track from a game called Star Trader. The track is called Launching, which is the title theme.
You just heard the title theme called Launching from Star Trader on the X68000, released in 1991, developed by MNM Software and published by Nihon Falcom, composed by Hiroya Hatsushiba, Keishi Yonao, and Mieko Ishikawa. This is an excellent track. It kind of like reminds me of like WWF guy coming on the stage. Yeah, this it is, is like the opening theme for him. I love this soundtrack. Uh, it's been, I think it's been on VGM Rips for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And uh, no, it's just a, a classic, good X68000 track. Uh, mm-hmm. It's got a lot of power, a lot of like tr- kind of triumph, triumph kind of feeling, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. I think that kind of triumphant feeling goes really well with that WWF type feel because they always walk out and they're so confident. I'm yeah. Gonna, I'm going to take you down. So narcissistic. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And uh, I mean, this this is so 80s, 90s um, type feel. It's very synthy. I loved how. They have those really long notes that just kind of trail until the next note. Uh, right. So there's no gap. And it obviously has really heavy drums again. Uh, the drums are very simple, almost like Casio drum kit type uh, simple, but they're really heavy and good and work really well with, with the other parts. And I really like that really kind of grungy guitar electric sound. It was like a yeah, zapper yeah, yeah. kind of sound, just like you know laid over the background which is really cool which you get to hear when the drums kind of fade away and there's another part you know like the previous track that i picked that you know the drums kind of disappear and you get, you're left with what's left of the song and it's still really awesome kind of just itself. the core right mm-hmm. this um keeps I, it keeps that energy kind of going the whole way the mm-hmm. whole way through uh and this track being an opening track i think it has um it, it has a great start to mm-hmm. getting you fired up. I mean, this is exactly what an opening track should be. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's you know, I think that's kind of why I said the whole WWE WWF kind of you know dude coming out on the stage because it, it feels like just really like in your face, right. like screw everybody else, I'm the best. Like, yeah, like fireworks going off, like you're yeah, like, like you've already won by turning on this game, and uh, we're going to reward you with something epic. So yeah, now you know the first time I saw Star Trader, uh, I wasn't sure because there was a this old game. Um, I want to say maybe it was for like DOS or something. It was called Star Trader, uh, released in 1974. Really, really old game, and I mm-hmm. thought it was like a remake of that. But it, apparently, this is its own kind of thing, right? Yeah, this this. Uh, this game was a little bit difficult to find any information on just because of the name. I was finding there's like some uh, Kickstarter thing going for some game called Star Trader or Star Trader 2 or something. And then the that original game came up and I had to make sure I looked up the X68000 to find anything about it. But uh, apparently this game was originally released for the PC-88 and is a shooter with adventure game elements mixed in. So I thought that was kind of neat. And since this is a Nihon Falcom you know, published game, I'm not sure exactly how much they worked with development but um on they were probably they were probably pretty involved at least in the music department yeah sure. and on different sites it had them listed as the the um developer as well so i don't know you know they may have had a pretty strong hand in this right. but i mean they were known for games like ease and dragon slayer but you know like some other companies they kind of took a break from the the games that really made them big and tried something in a different genre which was this kind of shoot 'em up genre But uh, as you can see, with the adventure elements mixed in, they tried doing something a little bit different. But from what I could tell, this game is not really groundbreaking and actually (laughs) follows a little bit too closely in the footsteps of other bigger games, you know, like um, Gradius and stuff like that, where they they kind of... uh, we're a little bit too close to, to the gameplay, but I did find... How, but how do you add that adventure element into it then? Um, well, it looked like they had some very detailed cutscene and story type stuff going on. Uh, I don't know about the gameplay, how they added that in there, but uh, I did notice there were some striking differences just visually between the PC, uh, PC-88 PC version and the X68000 version. So, right, right, right. Um, in the gameplay section for the, the uh, PC-88, it had this really big bezel that made the gameplay field look really horizontal mm-hmm. and uh, well it makes sense because there's way less video memory to work right. with and you know PC88 was definitely not groundbreaking in the graphics department so. right but then for their um, their cutscenes they were these big beautiful illustrations that had like a oh, no kind kidding. of a text box and um, but on the X68000 version the gameplay didn't have any bezel artwork to it um, and felt much more open and less confined right but their cutscenes had this massive bezel art 
that made everything feel really squished and the illustrations really tiny. Huh. Uh, so I thought it was really interesting that they, they kind of flipped flop there. I wonder if they kept the resolution of the the original artwork. The and... artwork looked redrawn. Oh, like really? It, they, the, huh. the example that I saw showed the same scene, but the illustration was of the same thing, but it was redrawn. So there was a little oh, bit. Of, okay. It was a little bit different. Um, huh. But there's this massive basil artwork. It was pretty Weird. funny. Weird. All right, you ready to move on to the next track? Yep. All right, let's see what we got here. I got, uh, well, I mean, that's going to be a weird one to follow up with. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, I guess we're going to tap into some weird adventure games for a little bit. This is from a game called Getsumen no Anubis for the Super Famicom, and the track is called Lunatic Dance, composed by Noboru Iwata. That was Lunatic Dance from Getsumin no Anubis, composed by Noboru Iwata. And this was released in 1995 for the Super Famicom, developed by Axis and Multimedia Intelligence Transfer, and published by Imagineer. Yeah, you uh, definitely got us prepared for something that's going to be kind of crazy and weird. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a weird track. The rest of the soundtrack actually kind of sucks. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, well, that's perfect to have it on for an episode like this. But I mean, I thought it was you know really funky, almost kind of hip hop. I like the use of that siren that kind yeah, of turned yeah, into yeah, yeah, yeah. an instrument in the song. Because uh, you know, at first you're like, "Whoa, that's really like, obnoxious." It, yeah, obnoxious. <laughs> and then it like actually becomes a very cool part of the song. And uh, I mean, I guess for me, one of the things that's been fun lately has been trying to put uh, the song into like visual words. So this reminded me of like a hip hop Sesame Street. Like, oh, I, like yeah, graffiti yeah. on the wall and you know, like Big Bird's got. But like, like a everybody's like on and, everybody's like super happy and they're spelling. Yeah, or like it had this kind of uh, this idea that it was like kind of grungy and and I could see like um, you know like graffiti and you know people like punk type people and uh, but it was very fun and and it's kind of silly almost. Yeah. <laughs> hip hop singing uh the abcs yeah uh no it's a cool track you know this it was actually completely random and i just found it like a, a few weeks ago i was listening to i downloaded like the whole spc set from snes music and uh i just was listening to super famicom super nintendo music uh randomly while i was programming some stuff late night and uh this came on and i was like it kind of I, I kind of turned my head and I looked and I was like, man, I never heard of this game. What is, what's this all about? Mm -hmm. And so I looked into it. You know, you hear one track and you're like, okay, maybe the yeah. rest of the soundtrack is well, incredible. That siren isn't going to let you not notice it. <laughs> yeah, it was very, very predominant. And uh, I turned around and I, I kind of looked it up and uh, the game looks horrible. The soundtrack <laughs> isn't really... I mean, there's, there's some kind of... There's some kind of nice melodic tracks mm -hmm. in there, um, a little more low key. This is the only one that's upbeat and kind hmm. of funky. Interesting. Uh, yeah, the rest of the tracks are um, 
a little bit more atmospheric and not really a little more bland. Nothing stand out. I wonder uh, what uh, made this part of the game, you know, require a track like this. Good question. I'll talk about the game in a second. But Noboru Iwata, uh, he was a member of the group uh, Cube. Okay. Yeah. So Noriyuki Iwadare, uh, he worked on Land Cruiser Three, uh, Tatsunoko Fight, uh, Tokimeki Memorial Girls Side. I don't even know what that is, <laughs> and uh, Assault Suit Lennis Two, which is a, a huge favorite of mine on right. the, on the Saturn, which is definitely geared up for a, an episode. Oh, we've been point. talking about doing uh, that one for <laughs> Assault Suit Series episode for quite a while. Yeah. Now this, so this game though, it, it's weird. It's a it's a visual novel, but it's actually classified as a sound novel. Hmm. And what I mean by that is, I guess the protagonist and the heroine um, are astronauts living on a laboratory set on the moon, and a group of American soldiers uh, are also stationed there. And the, these weird events start happening. All these like kind of sh- events shrouded in mystery, like like where did this guy disappear to? And uh, I guess there is a a race of kind of parasites that are taking possession of anyone and making them go crazy and eventually it will they'll um, infect your your player your main player so your whole thing is trying to get around dodge these guys and, mm-hmm. and, and anyways it's Sounds kind of interesting yeah it's, it's really interesting so the sound novel visual novel gone sound is uh, the, so this is kind of classified and I guess Chunsoft actually is the one that they actual actually made the, the term up mm-hmm. but what it is is like instead of a visual novel where you know you have a small thing uh, like a small bezel with text and then like the graphics are are kind of like the main what you draw draw you in you know almost Mm -hmm. like a manga or an anime this takes a different approach where the text is the entire screen and all the graphics are actually just very very subdued in the background Hmm. and yeah and the music is what drives the, the kind of the feeling so sound effects will play like if um, it says oh you know you you walk outside in this desolate land you'll get this kind of and that's why the soundtrack kind of changes like that yeah I mean when when you were saying that it was a very atmospheric soundtrack on the Super Famicom I was like well that's kind of interesting right. because you think of more atmospheric stuff as more modern stuff so uh, something as old as the Super Famicom which had you know crazy instruments and, and right. you know, very upbeat sounds and stuff to have something that was very much more atmospheric and not melodic was right. kind of interesting well you know and you take in like the visual novel approach you take you know different actions that lead you to different consequences or uh, different endings or mm-hmm. you know like you take your own path and sometimes they lead to the same path or sometimes they may branch out in right. different areas but you do make decisions, but it's kind of like they're all timed out to where like you think, I guess when you're reading it, because I, I, I did play it. I mean, I don't know if you call it playing it. I mean, mm-hmm. I did experience it a little bit yeah. where, you know, you're reading uh, a portion the music will change, but it knows, you know, when you're going to switch to the next set you know, with the next background and it it's going to kind of act accordingly and mm-hmm. you're going to hear that music. And so it was kind of interesting to kind of have this whole it's almost like you're reading a book with like a like a tape that plays at the same time, you know, mm-hmm. in the background. And so uh, I thought it was interesting. Yeah, the live orchestra watching you turn the page. Yeah, they're like kind of just waiting for that next page to turn. Okay, now we can start. But I was looking at a few websites. Uh, just I was kind of curious, like if anybody's you know done a review of this or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a few like I think it was like Visual Novel Database or something. Like they said, like don't play this game. Like it's, <laughs> it's like really bad. But I mean, you know it. Well, the story sounded kind of cool, uh, and uh, the idea of a very musically driven you know, visual novel is interesting. I think that sounds, I mean, visual novels tend to have uh, a lot of music anyway, and uh, sometimes they have some really amazing soundtracks, so yeah. I could see that being a really cool, for me, a really cool way to draw me in to want to try it, but if yeah. people are saying don't play it. And this soundtrack actually was released, too, so people did like the music, mm-hmm. I mean, enough to have them want to release the soundtrack it came out in 1996 so just a year after it was released and um, they had some arrangements and stuff on there so you know and japanese loved their visual novels at the time so yep. i'm sure this was I probably sold pretty well anyways um enough about anubis let's talk about your next track what do you got next up i have a track called legend from a game called scion 2 the first attack
You just heard Legend from Scion 2, The First Attack on the X68000, released in 1992, developed and published by SoftBank, and composed by Zenji Nishikawa, Tatsushi Takahashi, and Noriyuki Shindo. This is an incredible track. I actually heard this uh, last week because it was recently released on VGM Rips, mm-hmm. and uh, I was kind of following the pack as it was developing, I think, like four months ago. This was uh, logged by G the Guardian, so we want to say thanks to him because what an incredible soundtrack, man. Wow, yeah. I mean, this track, and this is another one where it was kind of the first track in the pack, and I was just like, whoa. whoa. Like, yeah. Okay. Like, like, I don't know if I can handle going into too much detail this time, but. Uh, are all your tracks X68000? Uh, yeah, they are actually all X68000. I, so when I, when I was first picking tracks, I, I came across Lagoon first, and I was like, man, I'm just like really feeling this X68000. So I ended up opening up. Um, just the the x68000 tab in vgm rips and started just going, going through, through games that yeah. i was either had never heard of before or it looked interesting and uh this one uh just by the the image that's on vgm rips is a wireframe uh a wireframe ship i guess it's I like know. red a uh, red alarm yeah it looks kind of like red alarm uh, but, but white. just yeah but white uh like <laughs> white like all the other wireframe games that you would play but uh uh when i when i clicked on it i was just like Oh my gosh, this this is so good. Um, another song that has really heavy drums, but then it kind of flips the script there and just goes, you know, boosters engaged, light speed, uh, so much energy. Um, that bass, man, it's so zippy and just mm-hmm. stays on. It really has like a demo scene kind of ZX Spectrum kind of bass feel to me. Yeah. It feels like, you know, the Z- ZX Spectrum scene demo stuff. I, I don't know. It just has that really like, like, like it doesn't actually stop like there's no stop between notes it just kind of like flies up mm-hmm. and down like uh, i don't know it's, it's really awesome though yeah i mean this this track had a lot of really good energy and one of my favorite parts is when the whole thing drops out and there's just that bass that's left playing and i was like oh yeah. man that's so cool i can't believe they did that and uh it just draws <laughs> so much attention and I, I really liked it and then when i started looking into the game a little bit more i was like oh man okay i definitely have to have this one in so there. i i don't know anything about the game what what kind of game is it? is it like a shooter or? um well i i couldn't really find much about the game i couldn't find anything on the gameplay or any real videos of it uh, other than the title screen image well i'm gonna have to try it out yeah but uh from what i what i found out about the game was that it's a little bit of an odd duck it's not a retail release studio developed game and it's not quite a doujin indie game either uh, this was created by a, a magazine a pc hobbyist mag- magazine called ox uh, oh, okay, O-H, okay. exclamation point. Right, X, right, uh, right, right, right. And apparently they did it uh, as a demo for the 3D wireframe program called Magic and how it worked with uh, Z Music Sound Driver. And also it's like, wow. well, the music was excellent. I mean, this was really cool. So the That's... whole thing was put together just to kind of show how the, uh, the wireframe... Um, mapping worked with the sound and everything. I was like, well, this is really cool. Wow, that's really cool, man. We should really go through this series, I y- think. Uh, yes. I mean, it, series. And it, so this is like, a, is it teaching you how to use the sound driver? No, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's just kind of like showing like a demo, like what's possible. Like this is, this is something that's really cool. You know, like the wireframe stuff was really huh. new back then. Uh, Cause like I said, this was 1992 and uh, just showing how like the sound worked with this, this, uh, uh, you know, graphics processor or whatever, and and it's just like check this out. Look how cool this is. That's funny because I got a lot of research stuff, research notes, not just today, but just over the course of time from OX magazine. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, at the time, it was I think it was pretty popular. You know, for enthusiasts that had you know. Oh yeah, I, I did read somewhere that someone dumped like a whole bunch of the the backlogs. I, I think that's how OHX. I read them. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's that's so cool. Kind of reminds me of, and we'll eventually have to get to um, our PlayStation Underground spotlight mm-hmm. at some point. But like, they did this game called Wormhole, where they uh, basically every episode they would like show you how to develop a PlayStation game and kind of go through. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it kind of reminds me of that. I mean, they might have. I don't know. I, I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't find much on it. And uh, since the soundtrack is so good, I thought, well, this could be something possibly in the future we do an episode on. So didn't want to dive too deep. But uh, like I said, I have no idea what type of game this is. It, I would assume it's kind of like Red Alarm and it's like a 3D wireframe, wireframe, kind of, yeah. you know, like shooter. But uh, I mean, it's hard to tell what that image is on the, the title screen. It looks kind of like a bunch of scribbles. But I guess I'll have to play it and make a GIF for this episode yeah. on the website. Yeah, I'll have to check it out. 
All right, so the next track, I mean, this is a big departure from what we've been playing so far. Uh, this is actually from the Atari 8-bit family, so like the 400, 800, XL, and XE. Uh, the track is called Song 2, or it's the title screen, from a game called Deneb, composed by Robert Drag. That was the title screen music from Deneb, composed by Robert Drag for the Atari 8-Bit family, uh, released in 1993, developed and published by Robe Spix. Cool. I mean, this <laughs> this sounded like something like a like a like a a video game version of something that I've heard before. You know, I, I, I thought, can't place what I, it was though. Right. I thought the same thing. I was like, man, you know, I feel like I know. This. And watch, one of our listeners is gonna be like, hey, you know, that was from this. Yeah, I'm not good. At, Mario. I'm not <laughs> good at remembering. No, it seemed like something like from like a movie or from like, right, like right. something of that that time or maybe slightly before that time period of when the game was released. Uh, and I'm not good at remembering stuff like that. Like, I mean, I'll hear a song that I've heard a thousand times, and I won't be able to tell you where that's from. But <laughs> I've only been able to tell you that I've heard it, and right. uh, for the most part. And um, uh, this has that feeling. So I, I don't know. For me, that that rings a lot of alarm bells that this might have been from somewhere but it was really cool it had the really cool drums and uh, I liked how there was just like that real repetitious pattern right. uh, and then this, the song had like a very kind of loose structure to it like it felt like um, it kind of broke that repetition and you weren't quite sure where it was going to go it kind of felt like waves i guess like you were tr you were trying to follow the song and it kind of kept taking you down different paths yeah it's got like this kind of eerie adventure feeling to it, it well i was listening to um, a bunch of stuff in the asthma collection and this is done on the pokey and we, we haven't really covered the pokey chip on this show i talked about it on the impulse project with ed um episode 30 mm -hmm. we did a whole episode on demo scene stuff on the pokey chip um and we'll have to do some game stuff related to it on uh on this show uh, and get more into it, but it's a four channel chip and it, it does some really, really interesting stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's simple. Um, it, it's, it's simple. It's beautiful. Uh, it's got really clean tones and I love the way it sounds. This track though, uh, when I heard it, I was going through, like I said, going through the asthma catalog and, uh, I came across this and I was just like, huh, this sounds kind of familiar. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I looked up the game. Of course I had never played it, but the game looks really, really neat. Um, real quick about, Robert Drag. So he's a Polish composer, and I believe he is the creator of Robe Spix software, okay. the company that made this. He did not only the music, but the graphics and the programming as well. So oh, I wow. think it's almost like a one man band kind of thing. Uh, he's done a few other titles, but not really much I could find other than that. There's a few Polish websites I came across that there was a little bit more info, but I figured I'd take a deeper look later on. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, so Deneb, uh, Easy Money, Colo Fortney 2, I, games I'd never even heard of. Right. Uh, all for the Atari 8-Bit family. The game, though, looked really, really cool. It's kind of like a, it reminds me of Pitfall, mm -hmm. but like more like modern, and it's got the... Uh, this adventure aspect to it. The graphics are really nice. There's like palm trees and coconuts and you're walking through this this um, kind of side-scrolling, almost like a Venture Island style looking oh, that's cool. background. 
and uh, it just it looks really fun. It's an action game that um, I guess you can uh, have adventure elements as well. So almost like it kind of reminds me a little bit of maybe like Fasanadu or something like that, where it's it's an, it's not an RPG, but it's got some RPG elements thrown mm-hmm. in there. So yeah, really interesting, and uh, I, I thought it was fun to, to put on the show. But what a departure from <laughs> all the the FM we've been listening to yeah. so far. Uh, anyways, yeah, so cool game, cool track. Uh, I do want you to play this, though. This is a really fun one. Yeah, no, I'll definitely have to check it out. Um, I mean, the, just just finding a little bit more about the chip would be really fun, too, because, like you said, it was very clean, and, and and I mean, just because it only has four channels doesn't mean it can't do some really cool stuff. So. Oh, yeah, that doesn't mean anything. It's just, uh, it's it, the Poke chip is, uh, if you want to hear, like, it taken to its limits, listen to that Impulse Project episode. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's some really unique stuff done in the in the game world, too. And we can kind of explore that on another episode, I think. Awesome. All right, let's move on to our last track. What do you got for us, James? Uh, my last track is uh, from a game that actually, once I started looking into it, I was like, this actually looks pretty cool. Uh, the game is called Night Arms, the Hybrid Framer which I, I'm not sure if that's like a typo. Hybrid is not really a word. It's not hybrid? Yeah, in the on the title screen, it's H-Y-B-L-I-D. So it hybrid. seems like there should be an R there. Maybe, there's a, word, framer, maybe there's a word we just don't know. <laughs> yeah. Now well, I feel really Google, dumb. The, the typing programs don't know it either. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, the track is called Ending Last Drive. Awesome. Let's take a listen. All right, you just heard Ending, Last Drive, from Night Arms, the Hybrid Framer, on the X68000, which was released in 1989, developed by Arsis Software, and published by NCS. That's definitely Japanglish right there. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't see it until, I, you know, when you were saying it, it, didn't. I was like, what do you mean? Like, it doesn't make any sense. But now I'm looking at the Hybrid, I mean, yeah, yeah. the RNL, <laughs> that totally makes sense. Uh, excellent track, way more mellow than I was expecting. Yeah. I, I hadn't heard this soundtrack in, it's been a while. Mm-hmm. I, I know that I've put it on the rotation at least once, but uh, it hasn't been on the show yet, so that's awesome. Yeah, and this was composed by Toshia Yamanaka, so uh, yeah. that's another uh, big composer. This was actually the first soundtrack that they composed. Really? Yeah, So, and and for those of you that don't know, he went on to work on Sin and Punishment for yeah. Treasure, and uh, it's just such a cool Star soundtrack. Cruiser. Star Cruiser is a, an excellent soundtrack. I love mm-hmm. that one. Yeah, no, um, this, this track, you know, it's a little bit more... 
mellow than I was expecting because Night Arms is a, a shooter, correct? Right. And I, I expected a little more action. Uh, maybe I just haven't heard it in a while. But this, well, this well, is the ending. This is the ending, yeah, yeah. So that makes sense. Really nice percussion, uh, smooth rhythm and tones. Just, just very feel good. It, mm-hmm. it does feel like an ending. It doesn't feel triumphant like you did it. It feels more like it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it was very mellow and smooth and kind of like, uh, kind of like, yeah, you made it and it's over. But then it, it, I liked when it got kind of real grungy and, and a little bit more zappy sounding, uh, and it had a little bit more aggression to it. So uh, I liked it. Uh, I liked it quite a bit. And then when I started looking into the game, I thought, wow, this actually sounds pretty cool. So it's a shoot 'em up uh, with max set in space, but. It uh, is a little bit different, so it actually alternates between 2D uh, standard shoot 'em ups, you know, side scrolling shoot 'em ups, right, and uh, Space Harrier style faux 3D levels. So, oh, okay, uh, so okay. it kind of flips I between feel like the I read two. That. Yeah, yeah. And man, this game is really pretty too. It's no kidding. It's a really beautiful game. I mean, in, in Space Harrier, you play as like a guy, and there's like you know the checkered floor and stuff like that to make it really obvious that you're moving in that direction. This has a little bit less of that, and it's uh, just really beautiful like sprites and uh, like buildings and things like that so uh, I thought it looked really cool awesome we'll have to look into it a little bit more I feel like it's been so long since I you know I'll, I'll research something and I'll get really into it for a day and then like I won't look at it again nothing against it mm-hmm. but then you know you just get sidetracked and do other things and uh, it's been so long that it's kind of like I, I need to re go through this and look because it, it sounds really yeah. awesome well and this game wasn't created by just anybody either this was created by katsunori yoshimura uh so the creator of thunder force so yeah. um so it's it it, it it's, looks really neat I, th- I think it looked pretty fun the music sounded really good um i, I flipped through a bunch of different tracks on, on this uh soundtrack and uh i mean i love i love his stuff i love his music spin dizzy 2 uh, mm-hmm. I, I just that was actually another one that I looked into. Oh, really? Another game that I looked into. Yeah, I think somebody just posted that in Discord the other day. Nice. Spin Dizzy Two soundtrack. They're like, "Oh, you guys should do an episode on this." And I was like, "Hmm, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You should." Uh, There's so many games that I mean. Yeah. And that's why we don't cover, you know, the the big Mario's and Zelda's and stuff like that because there's so many other games out there. I mean, not saying that we wouldn't in the future maybe try I, we, we a should. big one. We but, should give uh, it a shot. Do like a really popular game and yeah. just like see our take on it. Yeah, I think we, I think it'd be fun. But it's just so fun just digging up. I mean, I didn't. I we were running a little short on getting things ready for today's episode, and uh, uh, I thought, man, I'm gonna have trouble finding some tracks. And it's like, boom, find tracks was the easiest part. <laughs> yeah. That's always easy for stuff for us. You know, these expansion packs are like simple. I could put it together, you know, in like an hour and just be happy and content. Mm-hmm. The only problem, the problem I have is, is that I like too many songs and yeah. I'm like, oh man, I don't want to cut that. I don't want to cut that. Right. And uh, so that that's the, usually the hardest part. But if you guys like the show, let us know. Uh, you can give us some feedback on the website, pixelatedaudio.com. We're also on all sorts of social media join our discord server that's a, a great place to see uh, what other ta- people are talking about different tracks uh, a lot of great action in there I, I try to catch up as much as i can i don't have you know i can't really be on during the day that much but the discussions in there are just they're off the hook it's it's great i we should do an episode and just have all those guys on it would be yeah. chaos and it would be so fun let everyone pick a track and, and just go through fun. it like yeah. a round table i love it if you like what we do and you want to support the show, we're also on Patreon and you can find us at pixelatedaudio.com slash Patreon or the other way around, patreon.com slash pixelated audio. Mm-hmm. Uh, throw a few dollars away. That's always awesome. Leave us a review on iTunes if you have a few minutes and it means a lot to us. We we really can't thank you guys enough for the love and support we've gotten so far right. from all accounts. And so uh, just want to say thank you. Yeah. I mean, this podcast has turned into something bigger than our wildest dreams could have imagined. Yeah. And uh, sometimes it's hard to believe that there are, are so many people that enjoy the show and tune in, you know, every you know two weeks and stuff like that and mm-hmm. are eagerly awaiting the next episodes. So. Yeah. And if anybody wants to be an intern to do the editing <laughs> for the, for the show, uh, just, uh, you know, send me a, send me a little tip and, <laughs> and uh, we can... <laughs> anyways uh, so thank you guys so much for listening see you back in a few weeks for the next episode and we guarantee you are going to love it